Hello, I'm Michael First. I'm a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University and a research psychiatrist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And I'm the chief technical and editorial consultant on the mental disorder section of the uh, ICD-11 revision. So the World Health Organization released a version of the ICD-11 for review by member states after 10 years of hard work. Uh, and it's expected that the uh, ICD-11 will be officially approved at the World Health Assembly in May of 2019. This presentation aims to go over the differences between DSM-5 and ICD-11. Certainly in a brief video like this, I could only begin to give you a general overview. Uh, if, uh, for more detailed information, there should be papers coming out in the near future giving a more detailed comparison between the DSM-5 and the ICD-11. So let me start out by just talking about uh, the issue of harmonization. We do, as you know, have two separate classifications that are uh, very similar but still different. So when DSM-5 began and ICD-11 began roughly in uh, 2008, uh, there was an attempt to try to make the two classifications as close to uh, close together as possible. It was uh, acknowledged that there are a number of reasons why the, uh, the, the systems will continue to be separate, but the hope was to minimize the differences as much as possible. So a committee was formed uh, with members of both the DSM project and the ICD-11 project to try to work together to try to minimize the differences as much as possible. Most of that committee's work centered on developing a shared organizational framework for both the ICD-11 and the DSM-5, which is called the metastructure. So that was certainly a very successful outcome of this harmonization process. And you'll see very soon a side-by-side -side comparison of the overall structure of the ICD-11 and the DSM-5, and you'll be able to see how similar they actually are. Other efforts that were made that were successful to help with the harmonization process is that many of the DSM-5 work groups included individuals who were part of the ICD-11 and vice versa. So there was a lot of cross-fertilization, even with respect to the people working on the two systems. Uh, however, the timeline differences between the two um, precluded face-to-face -face meetings between the work groups. And what I mean by that is that basically DSM-5 was finalized in late 2012 when uh, at a point in time when the ICD-11 work groups were just formulating their proposals. So unfortunately there were never actually any face-to-face -face meetings between the DSM-5 work groups and the ICD-11 work groups as there actually had been during the DSM-4 and ICD-10 harmonization processes. And then finally, the ICD-11 work group, since the DSM-5 was pretty much finalized while the ICD-11 was in progress, the ICD-11 work groups were asked to keep an eye on the DSM-5 definitions and to try to make them as similar as possible and only to have differences if there are important reasons. There had to be a decent rationale for having the ICD-11 definitions differ from the DSM-5. So the upshot of this process is, is that the organizational structure between the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 is largely harmonized, although uh, some important differences actually remain. Intentional differences continue to reflect a difference in historical tradition. So for example, schizophrenia in ICD-11 is one month as com compared to schizophrenia in the DSM-5, which is six months. This is a difference which has been, goes all the way back to ICD-10 and DSM-4, and that uh, difference will uh, continue in ICD-11 and DSM-5. There's other differences on reflecting different perspectives on the same data. So for example, there's a, a new disorder that was added to the DSM-5 called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. This is a disorder seen in children that's characterized by outbursts of temper, chronic irritability, uh, and, and difficult to manage children. It was originally thought to be a form of childhood bipolar disorder, but it was uh, eventually determined that it was really a separate condition. The ICD-11 workgroup, aware that the DSM-5 workgroup had added this condition called DMDD, made a decision not to add that condition to ICD-11. Instead, what they did uh, is to add a specifier to oppositional defiant disorder. So the children with this disruptive mood dysregulation disorder uh, 
most of them, like 95%, their presentation would meet the criteria for oppositional defiance disorder, a disorder which is still in DSM-5. So for ICD-11, they felt that really, rather than this really being a different disorder, this could be considered a variant or a subtype of oppositional defiance disorder, and it's called the chronic irritability-anger specifier. So that's an example where two different solutions uh, to a problem, because these children were not adequately covered by uh, either DSM-4 or ICD-10. And finally, uh, I, as you, we'll talk in a second about the, the fact that ICD-11 does not have strict diagnostic criteria the way DSM-5 does. Instead, they have something called clinical descriptions and diagnostic guidelines, which are more flexible in their application. So in, uh, because of the additional flexibility, even though the uh, guidelines for the DSM the criteria for the DSM-5 and the guidelines in ICD-11 uh, on the surface look different. The expectation is, given the flexibility in the ICD-11 guidelines, that they'll probably end up uh, identifying the same groups of patients as the uh, disorders of the DSM-5. So here's a look at the metastructure. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen uh, of the slide, uh, ICD-11 is on the left, DSM-5 is on the right. And you can see they line up fairly well. But there, of course, there are some differences. The first uh, difference you can see right off the bat is, is that ICD-11 has a single grouping for mood disorders, which includes bipolar and depressive disorders, where DSM-5 has two separate groupings for bipolar and related disorders and depressive disorders. Now, that may seem like not a very significant difference, but one potential upshot is if a patient presents with uh, mood symptoms, a mix, for example, of depressive symptoms, and irritable symptoms, and manic symptoms, um, and you're not sure what the diagnosis is, in DSM-5, you're pretty much forced to decide whether it's a bipolar and related disorder or a depressive and related disorder. And the ICD, uh, when you're giving like an NOS category. In ICD-11, because there's a unified category called mood disorders, for those kinds of indeterminate cases of mood presentations, you would give that, you have the option of giving that patient a diagnosis of unspecified mood disorder. Uh, moving on, you can see the names of some of the uh, category, the groupings are slightly different. So ICD-11 has a grouping called disorder specifically associated with stress, whereas uh, ICD, uh, I mean DSM-5, calls that same grouping trauma and stressor-related disorders. And then on the next grouping, you can see uh, ICD-11 has separate groupings for impulse control disorders and disruptive behavior into social disorders, where DSM-5 has a single grouping called disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. There's also some differences in the orders. The, what you're seeing on this slide is the order as it appears in the ICD-11. Uh, whereas on DSM-5, we're matching up the DSM-5 to ICD-11. So personality disorders in ICD, in DSM-5 uh, come after the neurocognitive disorders, where, and, as well as paraphilic disorders, where in ICD-11, personality disorders and paraphilic disorders come before the neurocognitive disorders. And then finally, the, the, the grouping of factitious disorders, which is an ICD-11, and psychological and behavioral factors affecting disorders or diseases classified elsewhere, those are separate groupings in ICD-11 where the decision in the DSM-5 was made to have all of them included in a grouping called somatic symptom disorders. So you can see that they're pretty similar, but when you get into the fine details, there are some differences. Uh, one a big change for ICD-11 was the decision to pull sleep-wake disorders out of the mental disorder section of ICD-11. So uh, in DSM-5, it still has a category called sleep-wake disorders. In ICD-11, it was pulled out and made into its own chapter. One of the reasons that was done is if you look at the sleep-wake disorders, it includes some disorders which were classified in neurology and other disorders which were classified in the mental and behavioral disorder section. So you had this strange thing where you had something like insomnia, and there was a version of insomnia in the neurology section and a version of insomnia in the mental disorder section, and the differentiation between those two really didn't make any sense. So, uh, and, and really the separation had a lot to do with the fact that both neurologists and psychiatrists treat these disorders, but each one wanted their own section of the sleep disorders in the corresponding chapter. For ICD-11, a new chapter has been created and includes 
all of the sleep disorders, including those disorders that used to live in the neurology section, like narcolepsy, as well as those disorders that lived in the mental disorder section, like nightmare disorder. So this new unified thing uh, hopefully will make the, the system make more sense. And this is the listing of the disorders which are included in the sleep-wake disorders chapter in ICD-11. So you can see there's insomnia disorders, sleep-related movement disorders, hypersomnolence disorder, which is where narcolepsy is contained, sleep-related breathing disorder is where sleep apnea is uh, contained, and then circadian rhythm, sleep-wake disorders, and parasomnias. Another new chapter that was added to ICD-11, which is relevant to the differences between DSM-5 and ICD-11, is Chapter 17, which is a chapter called Conditions Related to Sexual Health. One of the reasons this was done was to facilitate the elimination of gender incongruence, also known as gender uh, dysphoria, from the mental disorder section of the ICD-11 to another section that would still allow individuals with these conditions to still be able to have, uh, to get uh, insurance coverage for their condition. So they pulled gender incongruence out. It is now in this new chapter. And in addition to gender incongruence, other uh, disorders having to do with sexual dysfunctions are included there as well. So this is the listing of the conditions included in this chapter called Conditions Related to Sexual Health. So you can see we have sexual dysfunctions, sexual pain disorders, both of which used to be in the mental disorder section, gender incongruence, which was in the mental disorder section, and then some other disorders which are uh, listed elsewhere in the ICD-11, like changes in male anatomy, changes in female anatomy, and androgenital disorders. Okay, so the next point I had mentioned this before about one of the big differences between the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 is in the form of its uh, presentation of the definitions. So ICD, DSM-5 has, as everyone knows, diagnostic criteria that define what patients would meet the criteria for a c category versus not. ICD-11 actually has two different types of definitions. There's a, a, a general definition, which is what's available on the uh, online WHO official uh, set of definitions for all of the disorders in the ICD. And these are basically 100 to 200 word paragraph definitions for each of the disorders. So that's what's currently posted on the website. That's the version that was sent to the member states for their review. Um, for a version for specialty use for mental health professionals uh, includes diagnostic guidelines for the disorders. So these are definitions that are in much, much more detail and actually look very similar to the DSM criteria. So the idea is that the diagnostic guidelines are intended to provide clinicians, mostly mental health clinicians, with guidance on making the diagnosis. And rather than having things like A, B, C, D, the way the diagnostic criteria in the DSM-5 has, they're listed with bullet points. Uh, each bullet point briefly presents the required elements of the diagnosis and descriptive terms. The biggest difference is, is there's an in intention in the ICD uh, clinical guidelines to be more flexible and avoid uh, very strict uh, inter time intervals like five weeks, four weeks wouldn't be used. Instead, they'd say things like several weeks to give more flexibility in the application of the um, guidelines by clinicians. Uh, there are some uh, durations and thresholds in ICD-11 which actually match, which are pretty specific. Like major depressive episode does use two weeks as the duration, and it uses something close to five out of nine. And that's because those thresholds have been empirically uh, demonstrated at a certain level of validity, and they're very widely used. So. Uh, in that case, to reflect the large body of research data, ICD-11 chose to use those very specific thresholds. But the vast majority of other thresholds were not based on any empirical data and were set in the DSM-5 in order to enhance reliability, but they make the system more inflexible and provide a perhaps false sense of uh, precision. So as you can see, here's an example of the, uh, differ, diff, the uh, comparison between the panic disorder criteria. On the left side is the ICD-11 clinical, uh, guideline, clinical um, description of the diagnostic guidelines versus the DSM-5 criteria. So if it looks very, very similar, but the things that are different, if you look on the left-hand side, it says uh, there's uh, 
several characteristic signs such as. Whereas DSM-5 is very specific. There's a list of 13 symptoms. You need four or more of the following. So the threshold for the number of symptoms that define a panic attack is more flexible in the ICD-11. So it allows a clinician, if there's a fewer uh, symptoms than the, the, the level of four, which is in the DSM, because it simply says several, the clinician uses their judgment about how many symptoms are actually needed uh, to define a panic attack. Obviously, the word several makes it more than uh, two for sure, but it doesn't have to be strictly four. And this slide is an example of the flexibility in durations uh, for uh, uh, panic disorder criteria. On the right-hand side is DSM-5, where it says you have that at least one of the attacks has been followed by at least one month or more of one or both of the following, which is a concern or worry or a maladaptive change in behavior. ICD-11, which has the same content, avoids the uh, use of the one month or more, and it says a, the panic attacks are followed by persistent concern or worry, and instead of saying a month or more, it says, for example, for several weeks. So by using the phrase, for example, and saying several weeks rather than four weeks, and again, it communicates that the clinician is encouraged to use clinical judgment when actually applying these guidelines to an individual patient. And then uh, finally, the, you'll notice on the right-hand side the DSM-5 criteria, the C criteria and the D criteria. The C criteria talks about the disturbance is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance or a medical condition. And the D criteria talks about other disorders that could explain the panic attacks. ICD-11, rather than having specific bullet points for these exclusion criteria, there's a section in the ICD guidelines called boundary with other disorders or normality. So these things which would be exclusion criteria in the DSM-5 are included in this section called boundary with other disorders and normality. So now I'm going to uh, move on now and kind of gives you some of the highlights of some of the significant changes. Again, this is simply scratching the surface and for a more detailed uh, delineation of the difference between IC-11 and DSM-5, you'll have to go to other sources. So uh, one of the differences has to do with uh, placement of the substance-induced mental disorder. So a substance-induced mental disorder is a mental disorder which is caused by a substance. So if somebody takes cocaine and becomes psychotic, the diagnosis would be a cocaine-induced psychotic disorder. So the placement of that condition, uh, or it's, as you can see on the slide, alcohol-induced anxiety disorder. This is anxiety that's caused by uh, drinking alcohol or withdrawing from alcohol. In ICD-11, this disorder is included in the alcohol section. Uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have the disorders due to the use of alcohol, which includes alcohol-induced psychotic disorder, mood disorder, anxiety disorder, sexual dysfunction, and sleep disorder. In DSM-5, that same category is included in the anxiety disorder section. So if you look on the right-hand side, if you look at the list of the anxiety disorders in DSM-5, that indicates the ordering there. Uh, starting with separation anxiety, specific phobia, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, generalized anxiety disorder, and then at the end, we have substance medication-induced anxiety disorder. So this uh, difference in um, structure uh, reflects the DSM-5 decision to facilitate differential diagnosis. The idea of the placement of this disorder in the DSM-5 was to make it clear that if you're thinking about uh, a, a presentation of anxiety and you're looking through the anxiety disorders, right off the bat, it would remind you that one of the disorders of the differential is substance or medication-induced anxiety disorder. Similar thing is true for disorders due to medical conditions. So you can see on the right-hand side, if you look at the listing of obsessive compulsive and related disorders, the last condition, obsessive compulsive and related disorder due to another medical condition, would cover OCD-like presentations which are due to a medical condition. On the left-hand side, uh, those disorders are included in a specific section called secondary mental or behavioral syndromes associated with disorders or diseases classified elsewhere. A big mouthful, but you can see what includes there are these secondary conditions. So secondary obsessive compulsive or related syndrome and ICD-11 is equivalent to the obsessive compulsive and related disorder due to another medical condition in DSM-5. 
Now let's focus a, a little bit more on, on some of the specific disorders. Uh, just mentioning schizophrenia, I mentioned before that schizophrenia continues to be different in ICD-11 uh, and DSM-5. DSM-5 has a minimum duration of six months, where in uh, ICD-11 it has a minimum duration of one month. So what that means is there is no schizophreniform disorder in ICD-11. Cases that would be called schizophreniform disorder in DSM-5, those are cases where the duration would be one month up to six months, uh, are, are included in schizophrenia uh, in ICD-11. The list of active phase symptoms is slightly different. A DSM-5 has two out of a list of five, um, and uh, the, 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 the delusions of hallucinations, disorganized speech, etc. ICD-11 has those five, but they have, uh, they basically have a total of seven. They've split grossly disorganized behavior and psychomotor disturbances into two uh, separate items. And they have this other item which is not in DSM-5, which is a, an item which has been in the ICD uh, conceptualization of schizophrenia for you know, 30, 40, 50 years. It's the idea that experiences of influence, passivity, or control. This is like, for example, the experience that one's thoughts or actions are not generated by oneself or being placed in one's mind or withdrawn from one's mind by others. So what that sounds like, that's obviously the phenomenon of thought insertion or thought withdrawal. In DSM-5, that's basically just considered to be a type of delusion. In ICD-11, it's considered to be a different phenomenon than a delusion. And the rationale is this, a delusion is a false, fixed belief about the world. This is an experience. It's the experience that your thoughts are being inserted or withdrawn. So it's really phenomenologically a different uh, phenomenon, and that's why it's a separate symptom in the ICD-11 compared to the DSM-5. So again, you can see this also reflects a long historical tradition of an interest in phenomenology, especially in uh, European psychiatry. Another difference is one of the, uh, to try to make both the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 a little bit more dimensional. Uh, DSM-5 and ICD-11 both eliminated the subtypes of schizophrenia. But what DSM-5 did, they gave five symptom dimensions that you're supposed to indicate the severity across those five dimensions. So they're delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, abnormal psychomotor behavior, and negative symptoms. In ICD-11, there's something similar, but not exactly the same. There's actually one called positive symptoms, which as you can see covers four of the five uh, DSM ones, and there's negative symptoms, depressive mood symptoms, manic mood symptoms, psychomotor symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. So the, the, you see it's, it's the same idea, but it's a different, um, uh, uh, different implementation. Substance use and addictive behaviors, uh, a difference that continues between the DSM-5 and the ICD-11 is how uh, they handle uh, dependence and abuse. So first of all, dependence and abuse was removed from DSM-5, and DSM-5 now has a category called substance use disorder with three levels of severity, mild, moderate, and severe. ICD-11 continues to have a category called harmful pattern of use of substance and substance dependence. So as you can see from this uh, uh, comparison here, probably most cases of harmful pattern of use of substance and substance dependence would be crosswalked over into one of the levels of substance use disorder. So harmful pattern of use of substance, which is not the same as abuse in the uh, DSM-4, is a category that was in ICD-10 and reflects uh, the idea that your use of the substance is causing some kind of physical or psychological harm to the person. Uh, which is, uh, uh, so for public health reasons, ICD-11 continues to include that category because they believe it's very important. The personality disorder classification, one of the really big differences between DSM-5 and ICD-11 is going to be in the way personality disorders are classified. For DSM-5, there was an attempt to move to a dimensional approach uh, for a DSM-5 to get rid of the categorical approaches, which is what you could actually see on the slide. What happened was, is after the DSM-5 process ended, uh, this proposal to have a dimensional approach ultimately was not approved by the APA, the DSM-5 task force, which was the uh, group, uh, it's actually by the board of trustees, uh, which had to do the final approval. They decided that 
uh, the system that was proposed for DSM-5 was too complicated and that they wanted to continue with the categorical approach. ICD-11, on the other hand, made the decision to get rid of the categories for personality disorder. The ICD-10 personality disorder categories weren't exactly the same as the DSM ones, but they were pretty close. As you can see for ICD-11, it's really quite a different approach. So you first make a diagnosis of whether the person has a personality disorder. And there's a definition of what does it mean to have a personality disorder. And three levels of severity are uh, given. So mild, moderate, or severe. And then there's this category actually called personality difficulty, which is not actually a personality disorder, but it's a category reserved for people where their personality is creating some sort of difficulty in life, but not severe enough to consider it a disorder. But ICD-11, in addition to these three levels of severity, has trait domain. So this is the dimensional approach, which is a simplified version of what the DSM-5 work group had originally proposed. So basically, there are five trait domains. And what you do is you give the level of severity, like mild personality disorder or modern personality disorder, and then you indicate which of the five are present or absent. It could be and all of them or none of them. And the five categories are negative, prominent features of negative affectivity, prominent to social features, prominent features of disinhibition, prominent anencastic features, and prominent features of detachment. And there's a, as you can see from those five uh, dimensions, the personality disorders in the DSM-5 could be mapped onto those five dimensions. So something like borderline is going to be uh, uh, probably a moderate to severe personality disorder with prominent features of negative affectivity and disinhibition, would cover the, most of the presentations of a borderline personality disorder. Now I'm going to end with a, just an overview of some of the disorders which are in DSM and not in ICD and vice versa. So with respect to disorders that are in ICD-11 but not in DSM-5, is something called olfactory reference syndrome, which is a condition where a person is, believes that they emit a foul over, but it's not to the level that they have a delusion that they do. It's sort of an overvalued idea. That was talked about in DSM-5 but ultimately not uh, 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 included. Then there's a disorder called complex PTSD. So this is a version of post-traumatic stress disorder where you first of all have to have first you have to have post-traumatic stress disorder meet the definitional requirements for that. But it also has more long-lasting aspects of the condition. Things like per, uh, per, uh, persistent social inhibition, persistent negative views of oneself. Um, it's interesting. The DSM-5 PTSD. Uh, definition actually includes some of the elements which are in the complex PTSD, but not all. So here's a, a, an example where uh, uh, ICD-11 has moved forward with a category of complex PTSD. Complex PTSD is considered to be more common with certain kinds of trauma, especially chronic interpersonal tra trauma like chronic sexual or physical abuse. Prolonged grief disorder is in uh, ICD-11 and not in DSM-5. It's in the DSM-5 appendix, and it's a category used for an individual after the loss of a loved one, which is normal. Nor loss of a loved one is called bereavement, and that's not a mental disorder. But if somebody one year, actually um, in ICD-11, it's six months. So six months after the loss of a loved one, if the person is con co continually preoccupied and um, not able to function because they can't get over the loss. That's called prolonged grief disorder, um, and that is not in the DSM-5. Uh, trance disorder and possession trance disorder are dissociative disorders that are specifically included in ICD-11 uh, and not in the DSM-5. This is one of, those, uh, one of the reasons they're in the ICD-11 is ICD-11, is, is everyone knows, is, a, is uh, put out by the World Health Organization for international use. And, and things like trance disorder, possession trance disorder, are very important in certain cultures and therefore were, were pulled out to be specific disorders. So the DSM-5 mentions that under the dissociative disorder, uh, other dissociative disorder category, but it's not specifically in there. And then finally, there's a category called partial dissociative identity disorder, which is in ICD-11 and not in DSM-5. This is a category which is for, it's like dissociative identity disorder, but there's, it doesn't have the full uh, multiple uh, personality states. In fact, it's considered to be much more common than dissociative identity disorder. So going over to the DSM-5 side, these are disorders which are in DSM-5, but not in ICD-11. 
DSM-5 is a category called global developmental delay, which is what you give to uh, an individual under the age of three who has uh, developmental delays in a number of areas, uh, but it's too young to be able to figure out what level of severity it is for intellectual disability. Social communication disorder is a category that was added to DSM-5 for individuals with the social communication aspect of autism spectrum, but without the restricted interest. So that was a sort of category added when the DSM-5 added autism spectrum disorder. That does not appear in the ICD-11. Schizophreniform disorder actually uh, exists mainly because the DSM-5 uh, duration of schizophrenia is six months versus one month. So they needed a category to cover individuals who have a duration between one and six months. That's not necessary in the ICD-11. Uh, Disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, I mentioned that earlier. That's, uh, that's not in the ICD-11 because instead ICD-11 decided to have a specifier for oppositional defiance disorder to cover uh, oppositional kids with a, a strong mood component. That was, in DSM-5, that's in fact included in the mood disorder section be, reflecting the mood component. Acute stress disorder is when somebody is exposed to a traumatic experience and has a reaction within the first month. That's acute stress disorder in DSM-5. That concept is called acute stress reaction in ICD-11. It's not a disorder. It's in the, it's in the reasons why somebody might present for clinical attention. But it's not a disorder because it's considered normal and exposure to a serious trauma to have that reaction. So that's why it's called a um, acute stress reaction. And then finally, the paraphilia section in ICD-11 has been changed significantly so that if you have a, uh, an unusual sexual proclivity that's not bothering you, not causing any kind of impairment, that cannot be diagnosed in the ICD-11. And ICD, uh, in DSM-5, two examples of that are fetishistic disorder, which is an individual who is uh, uh, sexually aroused by you know, uh, rubber, rubber some, some inanimate object, that's not considered to be a disorder in ICD-11, except if it causes serious impairment. And transvestic fetishistic disorder is an individual who is sexually aroused by cross-dressing. That's also not included in the ICD-11. So that's a, a brief summary of the differences between ICD-11 and DSM-5. As you can see, they're still very, very, very similar, but they're not exactly the same. Uh, hopefully this, is a, uh, this uh, presentation will serve as an introduction to give you an idea of what the differences are. If you get, if you want more detail, uh, there'll be resources available uh, that get into more detail about the differences between DSM-5 and ICD-11. Thank you very much for your attention.